In this video, we are going to now focus on the most common monosaccharides, and we are going to be also looking into the chemical properties of monosaccharides. So, when it comes to monosaccharides, the most common ones are glucose, fructose, and galactose. Understand that glucose and fructose are um, monosaccharides given by the following structures that we have here. Okay? Glucose is found in fruits, corn syrup, and honey. It is an aldohexose that has the chemical formula C6H12O6. It is also known as dextrose, and whenever they measure the sugar in your blood, it is that they're measuring glucose. It is very important because glucose, it is the building blocks of disaccharides like sucrose, lactose, and maltose, and it is even the simple unit that makes polysaccharides like cellulose and glycogen, which we are going to be discussing later in this chapter. Fructose, on the other hand, is obtained specifically from sucrose. We're going to see sucrose later, that is a disaccharide. Fructose, different from glucose, it is a ketohexose, but it has the same chemical formula. So that means that when we compare glucose and fructose, they are going to be constitutional isomers of each other. Now, understand that fructose out of the monosaccharides is actually the sweetest, and it happens to be that it is twice as sweet as table sugar. So sucrose is table sugar. Galactose is also of aldohexose that has the chemical formula C6H12O6. It is not found generally <clears throat> free in nature <clears throat> and it is obtained from the disaccharides lactose. And we're going to learn about lactose in, um, in later in this chapter. It has a similar structure to glucose, it's just that at carbon 4, so whenever we are numbering the carbons, this is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6. At carbon 4, the OH group in galactose is facing the left compared to the one in glucose, which is facing the right. Now we are going to be discussing Hayworth structures. So originally I intended to talk about Hayworth structures, but I'm just going to simplify it. You guys are not required to draw or identify Hayworth structures, but you should be aware of what Hayworth structures are. So understand that these monosaccharides that are shown in Fisher projections, so this is going to be the Fisher projection, or in open form, because of chemistry, they can cyclize and they can form a cyclic carbohydrate. So a Hayworth projection is going to be the most stable form for a monosaccharide. And this is going to be a cyclic structure for a monosaccharide. The ring is formed from the reaction of the carbonyl group and the hydroxyl group that is within the molecule. More specifically, what happens is that when we look at an open form of a monosaccharide, if we look at the last chiral center, in this case will be this one. The OH group there is going to react with the carbonyl functionality that is present in the molecule. And that is what gives rise to the cyclic or Hayworth projection for a particular monosaccharide. Understand that this Hayworth projections can be written for aldohexoses 
and ketohexoses. We are not going to go in depth into how do they look like. But as I mentioned to you guys before, if we look at the carbon that is the last chiral center in your molecule, the hydroxyl group is going to be reacting with the carbon in the carbonyl in your monosaccharides and that's what gives rise to the Hayworth projection. Again, so the Hayworth projections for fructose are going to be the one on the left, on the one on the right, or meaning the second and third structure. Now, one of the things that I want to point out when it comes to Hayworth projections is in Hayworth projections, you guys uh, could see that they are going to be labeled either alpha or beta. And alpha or beta actually refers to the position of the OH group that is going to be at the right of the molecule. So if we look at this position in the molecule, okay, if my OH group is pointing down, then that means that I have an alpha form in the Hayworth. If my OH is pointing up, then that means that I have a beta form in the Hayworth, okay? The shorthand that I designed to determine if I have an alpha isomer or beta isomer in my Hayworth projection comes from the shorthand Buddha, meaning beta up down alpha meaning i am going to look at the carbon that is on the right side of my hayworth projection and depending on the way that the oh is pointing if the oh is pointing down then i have an alpha isomer if i have beta, the OH is going to be pointing up. If we go to the previous slide, as you can see here, we have the alpha D-glucose. And if we look at the carbon that is in the right corner of my Hayworth projection, the OH is pointing down. That's why it's alpha. Remember the words Buddha. To determine what is alpha and what is beta. Now let's look into the chemical properties for monosaccharides. First we're going to talk about sugar alcohols. So understand that sugar alcohols are going to be generated from the reduction of a monosaccharide. Okay, Sugar alcohols are actually used in a lot of sugar-free gum and other food products because one of the benefits for them is that they give the sensation of sweetness, but specifically, they are not going to be utilized as energy, okay? So, when we are naming sugar alcohols, we're going to be replacing the O-S-E ending in the monosaccharide with the ending etol, okay? So, for example, glucose is going to, its sugar alcohol is going to be glucitol. Understand that glucitol also has another name, which is called sorbitol. So just to give you guys an example, let's say that we have mannose, the sugar alcohol. So if this is your monosaccharide, and I'm trying to determine is sugar alcohol, it will be ma -ne -tol. Again, we are going to replace the OSE ending with I-T-O-L. That's how you know the sugar alcohol um, name for a particular monosaccharide if it undergoes um, the reaction of reduction. As you can see, the reduction, just to review, is going to be the conversion of the aldehyde into the primary alcohol.
The picture that we have in this slide towards the left, several years ago when I was building um, my slides, one of the things is that when I search sugar alcohol, this is one of the pictures that came up. People actually assumed for a long time that sugar alcohols were bad for you because they were just taking drinking alcohol, um, ethanol, and then they were putting sugar in it. And no, sugar alcohols come from the reduction of monosaccharides into a sugar alcohol. Understand that monosaccharides can also undergo oxidations. And we already talked about the Benedict's reaction. So to remind you, whenever we have the Benedict's reagent, it is going to react with aldehydes that at the adjacent carbon, there is an OH. And in the Benedict's reaction, that aldehyde is going to be changed into a carboxylic acid. And overall, when the Benedict's reaction happens for a particular monosaccharide, we are going to be producing a brick red uh, solid. And that's what's going to tell us if this particular uh, sugar is positive in Benedict's. Any a sugar that is able to undergo a reaction with the Benedict reagent, meaning forming that brick red um, solid, is called reducing sugar. Remember, these are going to be monosaccharides. that give you a positive result in the Benedict's reaction. And remember, a positive result in the Benedict's reaction is the formation of that brick red compound, which is carbon, um, sorry, copper one oxide. Now we are going to move on to the next type of carbohydrate that we have in this chapter, which are disaccharides. And when it comes to this, we are just going to um, just mention what are going to be the monosaccharides that make these disaccharides. So the first one that I want to introduce is going to be lactose. Lactose is actually found in milk and it is produced by the combination of galactose and glucose. So for each of the disaccharides, what is very important to me is that you guys know what are the monosaccharides that combine to make them. So again, lactose is made out of galactose and glucose. I am not going to require you guys to know the type of linkage that forms them. Understand that this summarizes the different uh, monosaccharides that are combined to make the disaccharides. And every time that we're combining these monosaccharides, understand that water is produced in the reaction. So maltose is composed of two glucose molecules. Lactose, as I just illustrated, it's uh, glucose and galactose. Sucrose, which is table sugar. is made out of glucose and fructose. So let's talk about a little bit about maltose. When it comes to maltose, which is also known as malt sugar, as I just mentioned, is made out of two D-glucose molecules, okay? So if we hydrolyze maltose, what we are going to be obtaining is glucose molecules. We actually synthesize maltose from the hydrolysis of starch, and we're going to see later that starch is actually a polysaccharide. We can find maltose in cereals, in candies, even in brewing. It is the preferred sugar to give yeast in order to produce the alcohol that is going to be present in beer. Understand that we can find maltose both in alpha and beta forms because if we look at the last carbon in the molecule, there is an OH that can be pointing down or up, and that's why maltose can be alpha or beta. As I just mentioned a few uh, moments ago, when it comes to lactose, this is going to be 
milk sugar and it is composed of galactose and glucose. Lactose is going to be another uh, type of carbohydrate that, in this case, a disaccharide, that is going to have alpha and beta isomers because as you can see, on the last carbon in the structure is going to have an OH that can be pointing up or down. When it comes to the presence of lactose, understand that human milk actually has more lactose than cow's milk. The last type of disaccharide that we are going to be talking about is sucrose. In other words, table sugar. Now, this table sugar is going to be composed of glucose and fructose. And as you can see, it can be obtained from sugar cane or sugar beets. Now, understand that because the linkage between these two molecules, meaning the glucose and the fructose, happens at this carbon position between the glucose and the fructose, we do not have a free hydroxyl group. So what does that mean? That we do not have alpha and beta isomers for sucrose. Also because of that bond that is going to unify those two monosaccharides to make table sugar, this means that we cannot react sucrose with the Benedict's reagent. So in the Benedict's reagent, if you put it in sucrose, it's not going to turn red. It's going to remain blue. So that means that sucrose is considered a non-reducing sugar.